So welcome everybody to Shoreline. Uh, my name is Philip. This is Ryan. This is Daniel. Uh, Ryan and I are biologists out here, and Daniel is one of our rangers. He's also in charge of youth coral program. So you can ask us questions at any time. So I just want to tell you a little bit about uh, Shoreline. So we're actually on a closed landfill, unfortunately. In the 1970s, the city of Mountain View wanted to build a park out here at this exact location, but there was two problems. One, we were below sea level, and second, the city didn't have enough money to build a park. So he turned it into a landfill for 13 years and all the trash from San Francisco was brought down here and dumped down here. The problem with trash as it decomposes, it produces leachate and we're adjacent to San Francisco Bay and two creeks, Stevens Creek over this side, Permanente Creek over this side. It also produces vast amounts of methane gas. Methane gas is 10 times worse than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. So we're very concerned about leachate leaving the landfill. So we have monitoring points surrounding the entire landfill and we have a landfill crew which monitors, monitors them to make sure no leachate is escaping into the bay or the creeks. The methane gas, we pumped some of it over to Google and over, it used to be Johnson & Johnson, those three buildings over there, they're powered by uh, methane gas from here. It's temporarily on hold, but it's gonna be restarted very, very soon. We also use some of that gas to operate our micro turbines. And then the rest of it is uh, burnt off. We go from methane gas into carbon dioxide. That's it. But despite the fact we're on a closed landfill, we have about 20 protected species out here at Shoreline. We're adjacent to San Francisco Bay. We're also on the Pacific Flyway. So for birds migrating from South and Central America up to Alaska, they stop here in spring on the way up to their breeding areas, and they stop here in fall and return back to their wintering areas. So here's some of the species that we have um, out here that are protected. This little guy here is called a Ridgeways rail, and this little mouse here is called a salt marsh harvest mouse. Both of them are endemic to San Francisco Bay. They're found nowhere else in the world except in San Francisco Bay. So both of them are actually endangered species because we've done so much habitat destruction in San Francisco Bay. This bird here is a white-tailed kite. It's a state fully protected species. And for the past two years, they've actually bred here at Shoreline. Uh, this year they had four chicks. Last year they had two nests of five chicks. We have white pelicans and also northern harriers. This is another protected bird we have. It's called black skimmer. So its lower mandible or lower beak is much longer than the upper mandible or upper beak. And it flies above the water like this with its beak open. The lower mandible is in the water. If it touches the fish, it closes the beak and flies off. So they've been nesting on our island in the Sailing Lake for the past few years. So you don't make a typical nest out of uh, vegetation. They just dig a hollow on the ground. Unfortunately, our island has a bit of a slope. So every time they lay their eggs, the eggs kept rolling into the lake. So we made this simple little wooden frame, filled it up with sand, they moved in, laid their eggs, and this year we had 17 pairs nesting on the island. We're now the biggest breeding colony of this bird in San Francisco Bay. Here's another little bird we have out here, another endemic bird, only found in San Francisco Bay and along the coast of San Francisco. It's called the San Francisco Common Yellow Throat. It's only about that size. So it lives in wetland areas, and we had about, was it five nests this year? Mm -hmm. yeah, guys? This is our native fox here in California. Uh, we also do a lot of animal <laughs> rescues. Because uh, we're a park, people think they can dump animals out here. They dump loads of rabbits. They think they can survive. These rabbits are snow white. They put them on the golf course. <laughs> they just sit in the middle of the golf course and everything kills them. No! This is a little baby <laughs> raccoon that got stuck in our dumpsters. We couldn't go into the dumpster to remove it because it would probably attack us. So we put in a little ladder to help it get out. Down the road from us here, it's about a five minute drive, we have the largest rookery for breeding snowy egrets and white egrets in the San Francisco, South San Francisco Bay area. So we had over uh, 100 nests of these birds right along the Google buildings. But this is the guy that we're specializing in helping today. It's called a Western Burrowing Owl. So there's about 140 different species of owls around the world. This is the only owl that nests in a burrow under the ground. Most owls nest in trees, some nest on the surface. This one nests under the ground. But surprisingly, it doesn't make the burrow that it lives in. It depends on fossorial mammals. In California, it's California ground squirrels. Other parts of the United States, it's prairie dogs. They'll also live in artificial burrows, and we have a lot of artificial burrows out here for them. So in the 1980s, we had 500 burrowing owls at 250 locations in Santa Clara County. This year, we're down to four locations and 33 birds. So we've gone from 500 adults down to 33 adults. We've gone from 250 locations down to four locations. Those breeding locations are here at Shoreline, Moffat Airfield, San Jose International Airport, and Aviso. 
The problem with Moffat and San Jose International Airport, they don't want any kind of animals on the runways because they're worried about collisions with aircraft. We're a landfill, we have a lot of disturbance out here. And Alviso, the city council just passed an ordinance two years ago that they can develop most of that land. There's 500 acres, they're protecting 200 acres for burrowing owls. But what we're noticing at all these locations, as more and more development moves in closer and closer to these last remaining areas, they're forcing more other species that were foraging or living in these other areas into shoreline. Those white-tailed kites, last year was the first year they ever bred a shoreline. They used to breed um, along Shoreline Boulevard and other areas. Now we're putting down all those redwoods. Soon almost all of the trees along this stretch of Shoreline Boulevard may be ripped out. Don't tear the trees down. Last month, Google submitted plans to the city of Mountain View for its new state-of-the-art campus on East Charleston Road. Part of that plan involves tearing down 160 trees. They're moving into these areas. At the project site now, Viso, for the first time in 100 years, a pair of golden eagles came in and nested at that site in a palm tree, which is also very, very unusual. There's just no tall trees left in some of these areas. If they don't adapt, they're going to die off. Another big problem is, as more and more birds of prey come into shoreline and these other areas, most of them are predators of burrowing owls, or else they're competing with the burrowing owls for the same prey items. So we're doing a lot to try and save uh, these little guys. There's some pictures of the chicks, so just send them around. How many are here? No. This year in the breeding season, we don't need one pair with six chicks. We actually have 10 owls at the moment. So we have resident owls, which live here for their <laughs> entire life so and we have migratory owls which arrive around this time so they're coming from canada oregon and washington they come here for a few months and then return back up north to reproduce in the breeding season you actually saw them yeah oh. so what, how we know if they're resident or migratory owls we actually capture them and we put bands on their legs we use different colors for different sites and then each owl has its own unique number we got one success do you hear that bill clattering not a happy camper. So we'll just take the whole trap back. None of them are happy to be trapped, but I try to be as quick as I can. When you see them at a distance, they look large and they're all puffed up. And then when you get them in your hand, you see how tiny they are. Well, this is not always graceful. I cover them first. You know, he won't be afraid. Are there migrating owls just migrating through? Are there owls that come here just to breed? With an ID number, I can determine that information. So this fella is 74. 131.2, 165 on the wing, 76. Lois collects her data quickly. This bird's ready to go. And the owl is soon on its way. There, look at that. So what we've learned about the uh, banding project is they do move within the sites. At the moment out here we have four owls from Moffat Airfield. We do know that inbreeding is occurring. So for four years at Shoreline we had a mother and son uh, reproduce. We've seen that at other sites. So owls only live for about five years and they breed the first year after they're born. So if there's a male and a female they'll get together. Hey man, I'm lonely. <laughs> Mommy make you some friends? Okay. <laughs> they have a very, very short lifespan. Another problem we have is we analyzed our diet to find out what they're eating. We collected our pellets. And the number one species they're eating is earwigs. An earwig is about that size, pinch your bugs. So you only capture one prey item at a time. So if you have 10 babies to feed and you're bringing back one little earwig to feed 10 babies, most of them are going to die. So what we've done the last three years, we've done a supplemental feeding study. We fed them dead mice in the breeding season and we doubled the amount of chicks at most of the sites and we weighed the chicks and compared them to chicks who are not being supplementally fed and they weigh twice as much. We do know that prey is a limiting factor. We want them to eat more rodents. That's the purpose of our project today. So this area here behind us, this is a nesting area for burrowing owls. We've loads of ground squirrels out there. We have loads of artificial burrows out there and we mow the area. Burrowing owls are only nine inches tall. So during the daytime, they sit at the burrow entrance. If the grass grows taller than them, they can't see predators approaching, so they'll actually abandon their burrows. So we mow for owls, but rodents don't like short vegetation. So first they eat green grass in the rainy season, then they switch to eating seeds. So if we're mowing everything like on the golf course or here, there's no food available for them. 
Also, they're exposed to predators with short vegetation. So they like longer vegetation. So what we're doing with this project here, thanks very much to Aisha, who's been involved for the past few years, we're planting low-growing California native plants along the perimeter of the fence line. So that's where we're hoping to pray. There's going to be a food supply and also cover for them. So we're going to have nesting and foraging areas in the same location. So some of the plants we're using is, this one here is called Ceanothus. In the spring, it's going to be covered in beautiful lilac or blue flowers. It's low growing. This is a magnet for bees. Then we have a sage. We have four different varieties, so they bloom at different times. We also have an aster, California aster. Great for attracting butterflies and bees. We have California buckwheat. This one blooms in the summer. We have a naked buckwheat. And we have milkweeds, which is the larval food of monarch butterflies. We're also having monarch butterflies. A lot of insects are actually attracted to that plant. So we don't want any tall plants because birds of prey could land in the tall plants and then kill the owls. So it's all low growing plants, they're all drought tolerant plants, and we are using recycled water out here. We're going to water them with a drip irrigation system for about three or four years. Then after that, the roots are established, we'll turn off the watering system and we'll move our watering system somewhere else. So we are doing research on the burrowing owls. We are doing monitoring of the burrowing owls. This year, we started a relocation program. We captured 10 chicks, but they were juveniles at the time, from here, from Moffat and from Alviso. We brought them up to the Peninsula Humane Society in Burlingame. So burrowing owl chicks have a 70% mortality rate in their first year. Nearly everything eats them. Cats, dogs, snakes, raccoons, foxes, hawks, eagles, other owls. So they have very low mortality rates. So these 10 chicks, all 10 of them have survived so far. Then in March, we're going to bring them back here to Shoreline. We've already done genetics on them to make sure that they're not um, they're as genetically diverse as possible. We're going to create artificial burrows using pipes. We'll put a pair, a male and a female, into the artificial burrow. We'll put a hacking aviary or enclosure over them for about a month. Feed them for about a month until they lay a full clutch of eggs. When they've laid a full clutch of eggs, we'll take the aviary off. And we're hoping that they'll stay. So burrowing owls are site tenacious and have burrow fidelity. So once they establish a territory, they usually remain there for the duration of their short lives. So they have done relocations in the past with adult birds. They've taken them from one site, moved them somewhere else. The problem is most of them have returned to where they actually captured them. And very few remained five years later at the original uh, locations. So we're doing it with juveniles this time. So we're hoping that the chicks don't have that sight tenaciousness like the adults. So ask me next year and I'll be able to tell you if it worked or not. Um, during the 2020 breeding season, uh, we had a total of eight pairs out here at Shoreline. Five pairs were introduced pairs. They were taken as juveniles the year before. Those five pairs had a total of 21 chicks. Then we had three wild pairs, one from Shoreline and two from Moffat Airfield. So in total, we had eight pairs. We had 100% breeding success, which is very uh, uh, high. Um, and we had a total of 35 chicks. And one pair, a Shoreline pair, actually had a double brood. So that's, we've never had that in the past uh, 23 years out here. Very, very unusual. If this works, we're gonna try it at another location that has breeding owls. Then we're gonna start doing reintroductions to Coyote Valley, which is south of here. The problem with the four breeding locations, they're all very, very urban. There's a lot of disturbance. There's no contiguous habitat. They're crisscrossed by roads. So we want to bring them out to more natural areas after we get these populations established. We have a big problem um, with non-native invasive plants. Um, because we're a landfill, as the ground subsides, because the crash the trash decomposes, we can't have standing water on the landfill because it increases the leachate. So we bring in dirt from construction sites. And when we bring that dirt in, we bring every single non-native invasive weed on the planet onto our project site. A lot of these invasive plants, they grow faster than our natives and they produce a lot more seeds and outcompete them. So what we've done with this site um, a few weeks, a few months ago, um, Aisha got some cardboard and we, it's called sheet mulching. We put the cardboard on top of the vegetation, then we covered it in wood chips to suppress the non-native invasive weeds. So what we're gonna to do today is we're gonna dig holes in that cardboard, plant these plants, give them a good soaking, and then hopefully we'll come back maybe a year later and do some more weeding around them, maybe for one or two years until they get established or big enough to outcompete the weeds. Does anybody have any questions? Tough to say this. It's very tough to say something. People say, like, how come you have to do all this vegetation management? Mm -hmm. All these grasses mm -hmm. out here are non-native grasses. These are not our native grasses. Our native grasses were 
a lot of bunch grasses, purple needle grass, uh, calabarnia, barley. Uh, most of them are not found out here. Also, we had lots of herbivores eating that vegetation in the past. Tule elk, deer, and pronghorn antelope. None of those animals are out here anymore. So it is a lot of management and it's difficult on the landfill as well. There's a lot of regulations to protect burrowing owls. But the landfill technicians also have a re regulations to make sure they're in compliance with all the state and federal agencies. So fortunately, those two regulations don't always uh, uh, agree with each other. Um, so it is very difficult, but the city of Mountain View has been very active uh, in protecting the burrowing owls. We, they actually created a burrowing owl preservation plan. So we have certain areas designated as burrowing owl preserves.